Welcome everybody to MacBreak Studio Live. And we're here again, we've been here now every month, except for December, right? We took December off, mm -hmm. a little bit of a break. Uh, but we've been doing this since June now, every month, MacBreak Studio Live, have a little chat. Although usually we have Alex Lindsay here as host. Correct. Yep. It's, uh, a, it's a little uh, odd to have you in the Alex Lindsay it, chair. It feels a little odd to me as well. I can't, uh, those are big shoes to fill. So I'll, uh, I'll yes. just try to uh, hand it off here. But we do have a special guest with us today. Yes, we do. Uh, by the way, I'm Mark Spencer. Uh, this is Steve Martin from Ripple Training. And then uh, on my right here, we have a special guest, and it's another Steve. Uh, this is Steve Cantor. And Steve Cantor is a, an editor uh, from LA, uh, and in fact, an avid editor. And also an avid trainer, mm -hmm. right? And avid consultant. Yeah. Uh, and you've you've done Final Cut as well. You've taught Final Cut. You've used Final Cut. You're sort of have used both of these applications quite a bit, correct? I'm like the Mata Hari of of uh, the Final Cut avid axis or something. I've gone back and forth between them uh, with with ease for probably the last ten years or so. Fantastic. And you've also um, just completed a big avid training for for, for 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 Ripple Training that will be out sometime. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm hoping it'll be kind of like a definitive Avid, you know, six training. Uh, of course, some of the other Avid products like Newscutter and Symphony have more or less the same interface and everything. So hopefully, people who are new to Avid or new to editing uh, in general can hopefully take a look at this training product and you know get up to speed. Well, we thought it'd be interesting to have you in and talk a little bit about you know we talk about Final Cut and a lot of people are looking at different platforms and you know for different reasons and just get a better understanding of of. Uh, Final Cut, what Avid does, what Final Cut does, and have a little discussion about that. And in fact, uh, if you're watching here, um, there's a link over here where you can sign in to ask questions. Yeah, right on, on Steve's shoulder right there, you should see a little thing about asking questions. Um, you can see questions without signing in, but if you sign in, you can ask questions. And not only that, you can uh, vote on questions. If you see questions that, that you want to see us answer, you can vote them up the stack. And I can uh, read them on here as they come in, and, and we'll attempt to do that and, and answer your questions as we get going. So you do need to sign in if you've never done it before. You need to just fill in an email address and a username and password. And by the way, I just discovered that the user password it has to be eight characters and you need like a number in there. So just know that ahead of time and, and you'll be great. So um, uh, maybe I'd ask you a little bit to open things up and talk a little bit about kind of what, because you've, you've got some exposure to Avid and you've heard a lot of things and mm -hmm. you know we're kind of curious about uh, you know, we should be exposed to all these different editing platforms to understand their pluses and minuses and what kind of environments they should be used in. Well, let me just state for the record that uh, I've never edited one single thing on the Avid Media Composer. I, I used it once way back in like the 90s when it was, uh, uh, they, had, they had like a, I don't know, a consumer version of it. Do you remember what it was called? Uh, Avid. Uh, Express DD yeah. and then Express, I think, DD Pro or... Yeah, that's, that's the last experience I've had with it. So, I mean, all my experience has been Final Cut. And... What I thought would be great is to uh, to have you on the show to talk a little bit about well, what are some of the key things that uh, Avid editors like about the Avid? I mean, you're talking to pretty much a, 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 an Avid newbie. I mean, I've seen your training and it's and it's and it's amazing, obviously, because you know you're a good writer, a good author. But from again, from Thank a strict <laughs> from a strictly editorial standpoint, I don't know what it is about that platform that like avid editors love is it the trimming what is it that just makes it that people rave about well i mean obviously i can't speak for for all editors but i think that you know given that avid's kind of been entrenched in the industry from the beginning it started off really primarily i think as a, a film editing uh tool and then became more and more uh you know uh, entrenched in the television industry uh, my personal opinion is that the most important um, benefit of Avid over other NLEs, uh, and that's non-linear editing platform, for those of you uh, not used to the abbreviation, is the trimming. Um, the real-time trimming tools in Avid, I think, are really second to none. And what real-time trimming means for the editor is you're able to make the decisions that you need to make about where shots should begin or end using your instincts. You're able to play, and when your gut tells you that is where the shot ends, you're able to make those decisions in real time. And I think there's an argument to be made for uh, making the decisions editorially uh, using the same kinds of visceral human emotions that you want your audience to experience when they're watching. And so I think that means while the video is in motion. I see. So, as, as a Final Cut Pro editor, well, you, you being a Final Cut mm -hmm. Pro editor and an Avid editor, what, just, what is like one main thing that really kind of 
uh, delineates the two. And you said trimming, mm -hmm. but one in particular, because I, I've never really felt limited in what I could do with Final Cut 7, I mean, even Final Cut Pro 10 to a certain certain extent. So yeah. well, what is it that I'm missing? And I think that's really kind of what a, lot, a large part of our audience would want to know. Well, you know what it is, and, and I don't know if there's something I should maybe uh, show right here on the, uh, on the screen oh, here. Oh, look, there's the Avid. On there's there. the Avid. <laughs> so uh, this is, you're on, just to distinguish, because there's mm -hmm. multiple different um, pieces of software that Avid sells. This is Avid Media Composer, and this is version... This is version 6. Let me, okay. a, a basic primer, if you will, on, on how Avid works. Uh, this interface that you're looking at is more or less identical to all of the different flavors of Avid. But essentially you have Media Composer, uh, Symphony, which is basically Media Composer with a little bit better higher-end color correction tools. It's a, more of a finishing uh, or online editor. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, some of the uh, news cutter and, and some of the PC variants uh, that are used in, in news editing room environments. But they all pretty much look like this, and the tools are almost identical. So uh, I think just saying Avid software in general. Uh, and as far as what the numbers are, you know, Avid 6 is the new version. News cutter, you just add 4 to any Avid Media Composer number, and you get the news cutter version. So it's version 10. Uh, this uh, year, as of the release of the new Avid software, you can finally get a, a software-only version of Avid Symphony. So that's kind of a big thing. It used to be, you know, again, one of these $50,000, $60,000 systems. Once you add all the hardware into it, now you can get its software-only version uh, well, that's for because, under 10. That's because Apple, you know, changed the equation a little bit, you know. Yeah. I mean, with, you know, low-cost software. With a massive hardware. drop oh, in price, right? So I mean, everybody comes down, well, right? Well, think about it. Right. Final Cut Pro... Uh, what is it? One came out. Right. It was like 1999, mm -hmm. and everyone was like, "50,000, oh right?" Versus 50,000. Well, still, a media composer was a hundred thousand dollar proposition. Right. You yeah. know, you had to buy not just the hardware. You had to buy their boards. You had to buy their drives. And you had to buy what's called Avid support, which mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think was you know very pricey. But you you basically bought into the Avid whole system. Sy the whole right. system. You were yeah. you were you were you were all lock, stock, and barrel involved with right. with Avid. And it was very, very pricey. And then, mm -hmm. of course, with Final Cut, it changed the equation because I could buy my own computer, I could put on the software, I can get a DV camera, I could hook it up. And, and now all of these people were, were doing digital right. video editing, where heretofore was uh, just the barrier of entry was just from a cost perspective and a, and a, and a user perspective. Um, I mean, even then, I think Avid would, uh, the Avid user would say, well, the, the, the software is fairly mature when compared to Final Cut Pro 1. There was a lot of features mm -hmm. there. And what's, what's Avid Media Pills? Run now. It's software only. The it's software only version. If you were to buy it new, I believe as of now it's twenty five hundred dollars. It used right. to be three thousand in in Avid version five, mm -hmm. which is still considerably less. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a student, <laughs> that's where the good news comes in because <laughs> the student version is three hundred dollars. And while you are in school, so let's say you go to a four year university, this is a student version that has four free years of upgrades. So as long as you are there, they will give you free upgrades. And that's kind of unheard of in the area of student versions. Usually you buy a student version and there are no upgrades. Right. So right. the idea is that you know, they want students in film schools across the world or country to be vested into Avid. It's like, I learned this of and course, of right. course. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't necessarily want to compare the uh -huh. Avid company to, say, a crack dealer, but uh, <laughs> essentially, the new strategy... I was thinking about that. Yeah. Avid equals crack <laughs> dealer. I, I, well, it know. is addictive <laughs> once you get used to it. Right. But the, the, the way Avid is right now, you can still spend a lot of money getting a completely turnkey solution with the Avid support for, for, for high-end sure. installations. Mm -hmm. Or you can get in on the entry level for a really relatively uh, inexpensive price point. And once you really get used to the tools, they kind of have you for life because it's, it's hard to argue against the robustness of the Avid tool set. Right. So again, you were asking earlier about like what, what is it that distinguishes it that really makes a difference to an editor. Correct. And I think the trimming and media management has always been a strength that people have, have uh, given to, to Avid. And uh, you know, I think now Final Cut 10 has a similarity to how it deals with media to Avid, uh, but you know if you've ever had uh, media go offline, for example, in uh, earlier versions of other software, you had to manually reconnect things, you know. And in Final Cut 10 and in, in Avid, for as long as I've worked with it, if uh, you have a drive, say you forgot to spun up, uh, oh, okay, I'll just spin that drive up, and everything just comes so you online. So plug it in, instantly. and it just immediately connects, That's and it works nice. in Final it's Cut 10 and, right, well, yeah. and, and Avid the same way. And they're both have this database-driven kind of model for 
all the media. Yeah, and you know the thing is, if you want to, you can get into all the geeky kind of techno stuff that's that's under the hood that makes it run really well. Yeah. But but again, the user experience. If you focus yes. on that, you don't have to know anything about that. It's one of those it just works okay. kind of features. So um, while you can manage media, you sort of don't have to because Avid is doing all of that management for you. Okay. Uh, so you know that's definitely one of the chief the chief strengths. So let's. Uh, he was going to show. A okay, we're going to see some trimming stuff. Yeah. All right. So here's something that's similar to to Final Cut Pro, for example. So if I wanted to go and trim this edit right here, and I've got my A side or outgoing edit, and then over here I have my B side or incoming edit. Mm -hmm. This is something that both Avid and Final Cut do exactly the same. I can go Final to Cut 7 or Final okay. Cut 7 and I think to some extent Final Cut 10. Uh -huh. uh, my feeling is Final Cut 10 is almost doing this. Right. It's not quite there. Uh, my feeling is it's probably designed to do that. It just isn't quite there yet in this iteration. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can go over to one side and say, like I said, in real time, play to find that new moment that I want. And everything ripples or moves down the timeline. So now, while you were playing, you tapped a key to either extend the incoming clip or the outcoming clip. Correct. Outcoming. So the, the JKL control, where J okay. plays backwards, right. K pauses, L plays forward. Energy. Whether yeah. I'm trimming just one side of the edit, or if I click here in the middle and I'm doing what you know Final Cut would call a roll edit, and yeah. Avid calls a dual roller trim, this is no different in so Final it's, Cut. It's basically like the in Final Cut Seven in mm -hmm. Legacy Final Cut. It's a trim edit window, basically. The trim edit window. You're, you're doing with almost, dynamic trimming enabled. Correct. Yeah. So it's almost correct me if I'm wrong. It's in the Avid, you're almost in this perpetual trim mode. I mean, correct. You're a, it's a, the interface is set up for trimming. Yeah, it's very modal. Now here's what's different. If I decide instead I want to look at this shot and I want to do a slip edit, all right, where I don't want the clip to get bigger or smaller, I just want to change its beginning and end point. Right. Right. I want to get a different facial reaction, for example, so from different this content character. for the right. same duration in the same location. Now I could do this in Final Cut. I could do a slip edit and I could, you know, click a button or use a keyboard shortcut one frame at a time. Mm -hmm. But again, in Avid, I can watch I this. You in real time, and when I see that react, of course I picked a shot where the guy's not really <laughs> reacting. That's, that's sort of the point of this shot, is that yeah. he's very tired. Uh, so, let me, so let me go to this other shot, the out point, say. All right, I need to see his eyes move or something. Boom. All right, I'm able to make that decision in real time. So slip edits and slide edits, and a slide edit is just sort of uh, where I choose what I call the outer edit points, and I just no. want to make this shot move forward or back in time in the timeline. Again, both of these techniques don't make the clip any longer. Right. Uh, these can be done in real time in Avid, and especially if you are cutting narrative, if you are dealing with a dialogue scene, scripted TV or movies, where people are uh, often you know, saying the same lines in multiple takes, and you have to find the point to switch from one person's line to another person's line. You have to find really the, the best place visually and the best place and orally uh, to, to make that trim or that cut. Being able to do it in real time, I really think is indispensable. Um, no less an authority than Walter Murch, uh, when I saw him doing a Final Cut demonstration at NAB one year, insisted that all edits must be made in real time. Well, I talks, don't go that far. I don't think they have to be, but if well, you want them the to be. You know, the magic frame. Well, and, the, the magic and, and, the blink, and then Blink of an Eye, right? And his little mm -hmm. book of Blink of an Eye that he just feels when that when he should hit Well, he'd that. actually go farther than that in the book. He says, I, I write down the time codes, and there's something mystical about if I hit that same frame every single time. Yeah, repeated, then then that's cosmically, it. that's where the edit should be. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. And, and, and right? I, you know, I think there's definitely an argument to be yeah. made for that. Yeah. And I think one of the nice things that, that the introduction of Final Cut Pro did for editing in general, not only did they introduce a lower price point, but the technological challenges and also the ease of use kind of intuitiveness of the Final Cut interface, it really transformed Avid as a company and, and also the software. So right now you have, for example, this smart tool which is a very Final Cut Pro-esque way of working in the timeline. That's where I can actually go into the timeline and just drag things around. It is so intuitive edit. for some people yeah. and other people like trim mode. So really the way I look at, at Avid as a tool right now is you're not going to use every single feature that it has, but you're going to find the ones that work for you, that allow you to make the creative decisions you want to make, and ignore the rest of them. Yeah. All right. So bottom line, I guess if, if I had to make an overall point about it, 
is that as an editor, I don't really care that much about the technology. I'm a creative person. I want to make decisions, and I want to make the decisions that are best for the ultimate product that Which I'm trying story, to put the out. Story the story to, I'm trying to tell. Yeah. And if the technology gets in the way, that's a problem. If the technology gets out of the way, you know, the analogy of driving a car, I don't want to focus on the stick shift and the speedometer and the rear view mirror. I want to look at the road. I don't want to get to the destination I'm going to without having to think about everything that's around yeah. me. And that's what I think most NLEs no, no, really should do. I, I know that the question's there, yeah. but to, to his point, yes. I think that's what a lot of the people were, the people were, were working in Final Cut 7, they were kind of upset about when Final Cut 10 is, it now forced them to rethink about how they would approach. So that speed that they had in Final Cut 7, mm -hmm. now have to learn this Ramp new interface. So, so right, so there is something to be said for, I'm really fast at working this way. And then now I've got this new interface I've learned, so I have to, in a, in a sense, you know, start from the ground up. So I think that... But at the end of the day, if you can be faster than you were before, correct. there's something to be said for that. Sure. But it's interesting, because Avid really seems to be built around um, you know, the, the needs of the narrative film editor and the ones mm -hmm. who are doing uh, narrative scripted work where there's multiple takes and that kind of thing, that it's really really targeted and works really well for that. Good point. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple questions are coming in. And by the way, um, if you want to ask a question, you can sign in to the left right there. If you uh, haven't done it, you need to put an email address in it. And then you can uh, ask questions and you can vote questions up the list here. So I've got a question here from Alex uh, Golmer, and I believe that's the <laughs> Alex 4D guy, which is a really uh, does some great stuff for motion on the web there. But he's, his question is about the title tool. He says, back in 2006, the Media Composer titling tool had a 20th century feel like Boris and FCP. How, how has the titling tools evolved since then in, in Avid Media Composer? All right, well, actually, that's a good question. If you look right here, uh, in the tools pull down menu, uh, the option here, title tool application. Now it says application. It's a, so it launches a separate app. It, it launches a separate app. Uh, now, of course, I'm, I'm being a little uh, facetious here. Uh, well, well, once well, you stop, stop. There was two uh, options. I'll go back okay. there. I'm going to show that. But <laughs> if you're at all familiar with the Avid title tool, this has not changed. This, if it had a 20th century feel before, it still has a 20th century feel. It is a separate application, uh, but for most basic kinds of titles that you need to do, this is plenty good enough. Now, the other option you saw there, when I chose Tools, Title Tool Application, is another separate app that ships with Avid called Marquee. All right? Now, incidentally, if I check this box for persist, whatever choice I make right now will persist for the rest of my session. For all eternity. No, just while the Avid's <laughs> okay, launched right now. When I close, when I shut down the app and restart it, I'll have to make this choice, this choice again. again. Persist. Now, Marquee. I like persist. All right. All right. So, Marquee definitely oh, has boy. a much yeah, more yeah. modern wow. feel. Well, that's, their title well, tool? well, that looks like Boris, though. It looks a lot like uh, it looks a lot like Boris. Yeah, it does, and it yeah. and it has some very sophisticated stuff in it. Yeah. And, and again, if you need it and you want it, there's the tool for you. If you don't want this kind of sophistication, Avid has left in the basic <clears> title <throat> tool. So, are, are you able to do this in the context of the video or that you have to get out of this to actually see the tool, the text over the video? Because um, you know, no, it's black I have, right there. <laughs> no, no, so you, I, it's not something you use. I have really, so little experience yeah. with Marquee, I have to admit. I think I can probably get a, a reference frame in here. Uh, let me show this example with the basic title tool, though. Um, the, sorry, the basic title tool. Let's try that one more time. Okay, got to close marquee first. Um, basically, you don't have real-time video like you might in, say, Final Cut Pro, but you'll get a reference yeah, frame. Right. I do now, like this is a new feature, actually, I think, because I don't think I've been able to do this before. But in the title tool, here's my reference frame, or if I want to compose over black, I just hit this V button down here. Oh, so now, video. V for video, for video. Okay. exactly. Now okay. here, if this isn't the frame I wanted as a reference, I yeah. can go to the timeline and choose a different frame, and when I come go. back here, oh. it updates. Okay. So I that's think cool. that's new. I don't yeah. remember doing that cool. years ago. I, I do like in Final Cut Pro 10 where you actually just are doing it directly on the viewer, on the shot. You're just you're adjusting your text, you know, in not any separate window. Yeah, you're right there. Mm -hmm. And if you add a title, uh, you probably don't want to it's probably way. not that yeah, one. Yeah, Let's probably just not do that one. Something, just, uh, yeah, I mean that'd simple. be fine. Then you, you can skim, you just skim over it. You know, yeah, drop that in the timeline, yeah. and there yeah. there the text is, and you can start. Mm -hmm. You need to select it in the timeline first. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. And then you can start editing it right there. So, um, but I had another question that was right on topic with the whole idea of the dynamic trimming. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's called Trim As You Go in Final Cut Pro 10. And this is actually a really good point because in Final Cut Pro 10, you can do something very similar to an almost but not quite dynamic trimming, right? Because you can option left bracket and option right bracket to, mm -hmm. to, to, to do that, trim heads or tails while the playhead is playing. Well, are you talking about Final Cut 7 or 10? No, 10. In Final Cut 10, if, you, if you're playing and you hit oh. option oh, oh, right oh. bracket, yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll trim. To the play it, and I, I think uh, the play head, yeah, right. avid, I guess the avid parlance would be tops and tails. Is that what they call it? Where you yeah, do, okay, it's top and tail command. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, so you want to take over? And no, no, it's okay. okay. You can you know of tops and tails, but here, you're actually right now. And you don't even need to be in the precision you don't, editor. Yeah, you don't have to be the precision editor. So, but if know. I wanted to do it in real time, wouldn't I have to? Uh, or maybe not. No, I think you can be outside the precision inter editor and just press play and then okay. hit. Um, yeah, you can double click out of that thing. I'm trying. I forget where I was supposed to double click. Just press escape. Okay. Escape. All right. Okay. Now, yeah. Now you hit. And don't even, I don't think option, you need to even select no, a clip. Just option play. right bracket to trim or option. Okay. Sorry for picking here. I used to be a lot better at Final Cut 10 than, than I have so before I did all this training. Hit the space bar to play and then tap um, option and right black bracket. Yeah. I Where think did I did something wrong. Oh, wow. I don't oh, know. you know what he did? He, he used the keyboard shortcut to go back in your timeline history. Oh, I see. Oh. That's what you did. Yeah. Uh, oh, option, not command. Okay. Yeah. Go, yeah go. So hit the right arrow there, right there. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Now, yeah. select the clip. Okay. Okay. Option, right bracket. There's yeah. you. Okay. So right while bracket. you were playing, it yeah. trimmed to, to trim to the playhead. So that's so. How is that different from dynamic trimming that we're looking at in in uh, Media Composer? Okay, that, that is a good question. Um, again, first of all, I, I want to make it really clear. This is, uh, I think, an important thing for editors to consider. Yeah. I, I definitely don't pick a horse in in, in the argument between different uh, nonlinear editing tools. You know, a tool is a good tool. If it's the red screwdriver, great. If it's a power screwdriver, great. I do. I call you know? Final Cut Pro 10 Seabiscuit. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to do um, Seabiscuit. <laughs> but the, the, the competition yeah. is great because top and tail was not a feature in Final, Final Cut, Cut 7. 7 right. But yes. it is a feature yes. in Final Cut yes. 10. Sure. The smart tool didn't exist in earlier versions of Avid. Now it does. So these yeah, they're pushing each other. It's, yeah. it's best for us. Yeah, you know? I also call Final Cut Pro 10 Secretariat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. And it's it's really good. It's good to understand with yeah. all these NLEs, yeah. with Premiere, sure, with absolutely. Media Composer, with Final Cut. What what are the different components? What mm -hmm. can you really do? Because okay. there's so much noise about what's possible, and it's good to like cut in and let's look at specific examples. Yeah. Like, yes, you can do a version of dynamic trimming in Final Cut Pro 10, mm -hmm. and, but here's how you can do even more although, in Media Composer. Although that, what he just showed with the uh, uh, option right back, that really wasn't dynamic trimming. All that no. was is just moving the playhead to the play, uh, moving the, the edit point to the playhead. And it, <laughs> that, that's really what it was. When you, when he, what he was showing us earlier was, he was, and it was kind of nice, he was uh, using the JKL now, and as soon as he hit K, boom, the edit point happened. Right. You can't really do that in Final Cut 10. You, well, you, actually, you, if I can, this is something, as soon as Final Cut 10, 10 came out, I started trying to do this, because, uh, because I said it was the number one and most important feature to me. Sure. So, for example, if I'm going to go and do a single-sided trim right. on this side of the edit, and I hit L to play, right. you know, now again, what I'm playing right now didn't exist in the sequence. It was in the handle. It was right. in the unused media portion handles, of the right. media. Yes. Now, top and tail is something that works with the media the that's in media. the sequence. Yes. All right, so that's one difference. I'm not seeing or, or having access to that extra media. No, you have to go to the precision editor there, or you just you can't be playing mm -hmm. while that's happening. Now, if I playing. do this correctly, this is what I started trying to do. Uh, I'm playing backwards here. Right. All right. Uh, remind me what the extend. Okay, okay, what's the extend edit well, X for shift, shift X? X. Shift, shift X. X. Shift X. So shift All right. So here's my edit point. Right. Here's the handle. Right. All right. Now I'm going to play into the handle. And hit shift, shift X. X. There you go. Okay, that is what I'm looking for yeah. in in real time trimming. Right. The problem is if I try that one more time, if I remember correctly, like say I try to go back, uh, shift X, it's not going to work. I'll go forward again. Oh wait, it did work. Oh, maybe it, they fixed this. And it's in, uh, called um, patience from. Uh, what is it? Uh, fruit from the tree of patience. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm being philosophical. Right. But this goes to but, the point. But you really want to be able to loop, yeah. loop I would like to that as it goes. You want to keep going through. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. Here's the thing. So this is what? This is 10.0.2. Okay. Yeah. I have not been on 2 yet. So this is it. When this happened <laughs> and I started playing around with this, I was 100% certain, and those of you who saw me at the LA Final Cut Pro user group meeting will remember me saying this, I was 100% positive that this would work. Mm -hmm. I saw the foundation in there, it clearly is designed to do that, and it was 
Dotto software just wasn't working yet. So I had faith that Final Cut 10 was going to give me this ability because the foundation that I see in this application going forward is tremendous. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people went apoplectic about what wasn't there mm -hmm. and they didn't focus on what is there and where well, can Apple go from here. To that end, I, I like this. I don't like particularly the fact that we have to go into the precision editor to do this. Mm -hmm. I would like, in Final Cut 7, you could set a loop you could yeah. literally, uh, it's called a play and current, play around current, and you yeah. could just loop over the edit point, and as you trim, it would make the trim, and it'd keep looping. So it was mm -hmm. doing what the Avid Media Composer software is doing yeah. in so, the timeline. I, so, I'd like so to see that added back let's in. Try, you can turn on looping under uh, uh, view, right. loop, loop playback. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to show what I, how much I remember. Well, you know what? Let's, let's take this opportunity to show everybody one of my favorite OS X features. If you go to the help menu and just type in the word loop, it will, oh, there's the command, and where is it? Oh, there it is. Yes. Now I can choose it right here. I like right. how the arrow just kind of floats. floats yeah, there. it's kind it's of moving around arrow. and bring your nice? attention to it. Yeah. Oh. All right, so here I'm hitting loop. And, 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 uh, and then from there, you can do play well, around play current, around right? Current, right. It just hit the slash key. You should play around current. The uh, forward slash key. Sorry. They changed it from. Uh, Actually, that'll do. That'll do around the selected title. So That's is what it I'm using for. Is it shift that? There we yeah, go. shift go. forward slash. And let's see if that'll just loop. Let's see. Okay. Let's see it loop. Let's nope. It looping. Maybe looping make, was loop, on make sure already. Make sure playback. It's under the view menu. Uh, playback. 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 Top okay. one. Top one. Playback. Line. Loop playback. Command L. There you yeah, go. It wasn't. It wasn't. Active. Okay, it was active, and I probably just inactivated yeah. Yeah. it. All right. <laughs> inactivate it. Yeah, I can now the question is, words. it'll loop, but once you do the edit, will it keep looping? Because that's, that's what you want. Right yeah. Okay, let's oh, look, 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 look at that. It's beautiful. Okay. Okay. It's gonna, look now. Look at that. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, Apple. Apple, you but have to fix that. But it's so close, okay, look, right? It's so close. You have to fix that. If you yeah. fix that, yeah. oh my gosh, so many yeah. editors will be. Yeah. So you essentially have dynamic trimming right there, but you do have to go into the precision editor mm -hmm. to do that, but you're, you're very yeah. close to having it. And it's it. not, you know, again, it's not quite as sophisticated in the sense that, you know, what I'm looking at right here in this single monitor. Right. But can't you go to the preferences really and nice show uh, detail feedback? We'll show, we'll do a two up on that. It'll do a two up, but I don't think in real time. Not no, real time. it won't. Okay. It won't. Um, so we're, just, that, we're in a constant two up mode here. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. <laughs> and in fact, if I can go turn on this feature, it is dual image play is on. Uh -huh. All right. Now this is something that definitely does not seem to exist uh, in other software. Uh, if I'm doing uh, a dual roller trim right now, and I want to see where this shot ends and this shot begins, and I'm trying to sort of find a common sync point, you know, when this guy's about to start running. Yeah. As I play, they're both updating, both windows at the same time. Ooh, that's nice. All right, which is, which is one of the things when I think when Malter Merch talked about his technique of basically trying to find that point, that sweet spot for the edit, so he'd play or something, and then go, all right, boom, that's where I want the edit to be, and then he would. Type command Z to undo it and try it again. Dynabed. And then the and files he, would open and a ray of yeah. sunshine would come and down. And if he could hit yeah. the same point right. twice in a row, then that meant that was the right yeah. place to go. Um, so again, you know, it's it's up to the, the user how he or she wants to use this software. But as of this version of Avid, I feel like there's pretty much an option in there for any type of person, whether you like to be mouse driven or you like to be keyboard driven. Yeah. So Actually, before we take one more question, can I address one point you made, which I thought uh, bears mentioning? You were saying that uh, you know it's really more geared, or, or definitely shows its its uh, pro features when dealing with narrative kind mm -hmm. of. It's pedigree. It's pedigree. Thank you. That's Thank a you. much better way of putting yeah. it. Um, I'm going to do one thing though that I think is a boon for documentary editing. I'm typing <laughs> Command F for Find. Now this is a Find window, but I'm not just going to search for metadata using okay. this find. There is a feature in Avid called Phrase Find. It's a phonetic search engine. And it's actually going to search the clip's audio for this word, supercharge. If I hit, and you can see I already did the search. Sweet. But if I now look for supercharge, here's a clip that seems to have supercharged in it. All right, and I'll hit play. And get supercharged. So, That's great. So it it found, <laughs> and you didn't have any. There's not based on a script. It's just the audio file. It's able to to dissect the audio, mm -hmm. understand the words, and do and find specific phrases in there. Yeah, in a way, words. In a way, the way Siri seems to understand voice commands on the iPhone, 
a phrase find will analyze all of your media as soon as it's brought into the Avid without you even doing anything. So background kind of thing. It's a uh -huh. background process. It analyzes all the audio. Once it has analyzed it, it has its own database. So the searching when you are looking for things is like instantaneous. Now, uh, that being said, there is a Final Cut Pro uh, capable version of this. It's the exact same company behind it, Nexidia, that makes the search engine. Uh, it's called Boris Soundbite, and it works with Final Cut 7, and I'm pretty sure I think 10, 10 so as well. 10. Yeah. All right? yes. If you have not seen this software, I, you know, I don't work for the company, although I did edit a video for them, because they're like, hey, let's, let's so see how you like the software. They only paid them like $10,000 to make no, it. Yeah. No, no. Uh, I'm not going to say how much I'm they paid me, but it certainly isn't enough for me to like work for them. Right. Yeah. But this software, I'm 100% serious, will pay for itself in the first hour you use it. It's just unbelievable. Well, I've, I've seen that demo, and it's very impressive. I definitely want to try it out. And if you're doing documentary work, and the ability to find where somebody talks oh about my gosh. And you were, you were using <laughs> some very dry stuff about some Senate yeah. hearings or something, and you needed the word, I don't know, what was congressional? I don't know. Yeah, some, I, was, I thought it was Joe Biden. No, no, I, I think I was looking for <laughs> um, so. subcommittee or oh, something. Oh, that's yeah, right. Subcommittee, yeah. Yes. And it would, go, it would jump right, right to where somebody said subcommittee, yeah, which is sure. like it, brilliant. The amount of time it would save you scrubbing, because documentary, you've got these 101 shooting ratios, right? Where you've got yeah. Yeah. all this stuff to slog through and you're sending out your your interviews to get um, transcribed and reading through them you to some extent you can bypass a lot of that because you yeah. can say jump to where he's talking about so, scandal or wh yeah. whatever it is I mean you could what I was doing the other day uh, was literally going through a scandal. text script and <laughs> highlighting text in the script right. copying it pasting it into the Boris soundbite window and then finding that instantly. Now the way Boris soundbite works is once it finds the moment you're looking for, you can literally send a marker to Final Cut Pro and it marks it for you. So, you know, basically I don't see much of a difference functionally between Phrase Find in Avid and Boris soundbite. They're both amazing tools. Mm -hmm. um, Script Sync, which is kind of a similar feature in Avid, again, allows you to bring in a script and use it to find the moments in your in your clips so that you can essentially highlight text and then you find that line in the, in the script. Um, again, these are features, I think, that, that if you have to cut narrative for a living or you have to do documentaries, these are the kinds of things that kind of are almost immeasurably valuable. Right, absolutely. So we have um, another question here, and, and just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, you can sign in over to my side here, and you can ask a question about Final Cut Pro, about Avid, uh, about Motion. Or about uh, Sound Find, or Phrase Find. Is, phrase it phrase find, or, is Phrase spelled with an F? It's spelled with a P. Or is he? No. And then what, what was the Bor Boris Soundbite? Boris Soundbite. Sound okay. yeah. But here's, here's a question about Avid dual play versus FCP ganging. What is the difference between Avid's dual video playing that Steve demoed and Final Cut Pro 7's gang clip playback? Well, I mean, I would say quite a bit. We don't have Final we're not, Cut yeah, we're not, we don't have to Final demonstrate, Cut 7 here. but there's a gang feature right here. Yeah. So let's say How if, would you use gang? It's there's a couple one. ways I'd use gang. Let's say this probably isn't the best project right. to do this with, but let's say here I have like a close-up. Uh -huh. of, uh, or a medium shot of, of this exchange uh, between these characters. Here's a, a wider shot. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and use the match frame feature to match frame back to that shot. Now, is it is doing the same thing as Final Cut? You're bringing up the, uh, like the source clip or the at browser the, clip? The play, Correct. It's not the play, play it's the... Uh, the position, they, indicator, position indicator, they call it. Position indicator. And, you know, if I may <laughs> say, I, I do have to pick something in this. I have to give credit to Final Cut for finding a nice easy term, playhead, to refer to this thing. After doing the training for the last you know, uh, few months, having to write position indicator yeah. and say <laughs> position oh, indicator Alan, all the time. And but don't Adobe's current time, CTI. CTI, yeah. current time, yeah. time indicator. indicator. Yeah. Now, now, admittedly, playhead. playhead. <laughs> there's <laughs> avid parlance right. that starts taking up. So right. for example, down here at the bottom left corner is something called the fast menu. It looks but like every, a hamburger, it looks like a hamburger. It does, and everyone calls this the hamburger menu. All avid editors call <laughs> it the hamburger menu. Yeah. The you already knew that. This, I did, I cheated, yes. See if you can guess what the nickname for the position indicator is with uh, Avid Editors. Uh, it's very intuitive. It's the blue bar. All right, so the blue bar. Okay. Right, so again, if I if double I Double blue bar. It looks like a double blue bar. Well, because it's a frame boundary, isn't I'm, it? Yeah, I'm zoomed oh, in so much, it's close. showing me the width of one frame. That's actually cool. That is that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. 
Now, this this is clearly shot. By the way, Final Cut 10 shows you the width of one yeah. frame, too. So, yeah, so this is shot six thing. underscore 11. Right. And again, I'm hitting the match frame okay. button. So now what I can do is turn on ganging. This is exactly how it would work in Final Cut. Now, if I go back earlier in the shot and I decided I wanted to sort of do a cutaway or a punch into this close up, mm -hmm. well, now I know these things are still in sync. So I could say mark an endpoint. You know, get a little bit of that in there, and then I'll just target the track for an overwrite edit. And, you know, in theory, this stuff should be matched together well. Now, I wasn't paying too much attention. That's one way to use ganging, is I want to kind of find something in another shot. Um, Avid will allow you to actually load a sequence into the source monitor and do some pretty sophisticated uh, uh, editing with it. Right. And, you, know, you can load a source in Final Cut 7 as well or a sequence and source. Um, but what's really different about this is we're not talking about making trimming decisions with this gang feature. Now, what you could do, and I don't know if this is what the questioner was going for, is here I have a shot, an outgoing shot, and I don't know what's in the handle past right, that point. Right. I don't know what it looks like. But if I match frame to it and gang... Well, over here, I can see what's happening in this right, shot. Right, beyond the outpoint. Yes. And yes. then I could go down here and say, yeah, I, I like that piece of material. I'll, I'll do an extend edit, for example, ah, to that good. point. And so that's, that's a trim. That that's a, a way trim. of yeah. doing a trim, and that's and a way of getting the feedback that you're looking for. Sure. And in Final Cut 7, you could do that same thing, gang the play, and do yeah. exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Not same match frame, the same, the same kind of thing. But see, it's not quite as fast, I guess, is, is what I would say is the difference. OK. As well, that's more, that's, that's important. There seems to be more clicking involved in the Avid mm -hmm. than there was in Final Cut 7. You just Turn on a little pop-up in 7 in there. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, there's a clunkiness, some people might say, to how modal Avid is. Right. Here I am in source record mode. I can't really trim. Here I am in trim mode. I can't really move a clip around. Of course, now that the smart tool has entered the, the, the workflow, if you will, all bets are off. I can do whatever I want right now with the smart tool and active. It, and it, yeah. Right. Well, that's nice. So if you're coming, if you are coming from Final Cut Seven, you're already going to you'll be familiar with you know trimming. A lot of times you are doing trimming in the timeline. You're not mm -hmm. in a trim mode in Final Cut Seven. Yeah, and I would say you know I, I spent probably close to ten years sort of following uh, our good friend Diana Winans sort of uh, methodology of, of a Final Cut Pro class for Avid editors, sure. sort of an easy bridge. And I used to always think, oh, it's going to be so much harder for an, uh, a Final Cut editor to go to Avid because of how you know, different and sophisticated and the, the, the mindset is totally different. Uh, again, I think what's changed about Avid as a company is if you're a Final Cut editor and you have to learn Avid, it's so much easier now than it ever was because that smart tool is essentially giving you the tools that you probably were very fast at. I'm familiar with, yeah. All right? and, and I think that while you might take a hit sometimes in speed when you go from one platform to another, I feel like I'm a better editor, a better creative thinker because I've gone back and forth between both platforms, because you always learn some technique in the other platform, and then you try to apply it to the new one. If you never switched platforms, you'd find what works and you'd stick with it. You'd never get any better. Might right. not get any worse, but right. you wouldn't really get any better. And by going back and forth and challenging yourself, I think you come back, if you do have a favorite, you'll come back a better editor and be even better and faster. Right, right. Well, there was a time in the not too distant past where if you want to get a job, you know, in the major markets, you know, Hollywood, New York, mm -hmm. whatever, you really have to know both apps. You'd have to yeah. be able to know Av Avid and Final Cut Pro 7. You so know, um, we've got a bunch more questions coming in here. Good. And by the way, that was uh, Paul who asked that question. So thanks, Paul. That was great. Here's a question about Lion. I'm still on Snow Leopard, on the Snow Leopard side of the fence. How well does Avid work with Lion? Should I stay with Snow Leopard? Well, yeah. <laughs> good, good question, actually. <laughs> yeah, about we talked about this today. 10, 6, 8. Uh, so far, so good. Okay. However, it's supposed to, so, so just to clarify, mm -hmm. Avid Music Composer 6 is supposed to run, they recommend it runs on Lion, correct? Correct. And do okay. you know why? No, we don't. Tell us why. <laughs> Here's why. It is running. On Snow Leopard. On Snow Leopard. No problem. But it's running in 32-bit mode. Mm. You cannot take advantage of 64-bit technology, which, again, this is kind of geeky behind-the-scenes stuff. The way it translates into the editor experience is that you will be able to work faster. There will be future... There, sorry, future... There will be fewer spinning beach balls. There will be less <laughs> waiting around. You'll be able to play more layers in, uh, in real time. I mean, there are so many advantages to the 64-bit architecture. And I think that's the, 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 
uh, selling point, if you will, or one of the justifications of Final Cut 10. Final Cut 10 is now 64-bit. But you know? so you're going to want to be on Lion. Is sort of the answer to that question. I think you're so. going to want to be on Lion. And my understanding yeah. is it doesn't necessarily make rendering faster. What it does is makes menus open faster. Windows, you know, mm -hmm. like in the uh, non 64 bit, like when you opened a bin, it would just take a long time to load up all those clips. My understanding is the 64 bit improves the overall performance of the app from an yeah. inter from an interface standard. But not necessarily render again. No, not rendering. Okay. But but as, as a practical example, again going back yeah. to the example of trying to make a decision in real time, right. whether it's trimming or anything else, if there's any latency in the system based on too many bins being open, memory being full, or something. But hasn't like that. that been typically a problem though? I mean, when the, the Atlas problems just get these balloon out inside, they, they, things get slower. I think it's a problem with. I mean, I've had that problem in Final Cut and Avid. Okay. They 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 approach dealing with memory a little bit. Uh, differently. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Again, without getting too geeky, the Final Cut project was always one file and all of your bins and all of your sequences and all and of one, everything. And, it, and sometimes it could get just massive. All of a sudden it's 50 or 100 megs. Just, yeah. It would oh, yeah. just get it, huge. It and would. there was no, you know, you could Take throw away some open, stuff. Right? Yeah. But when that project got big, it stayed big. Avid each bin, each one of these bins is its own file. So to some extent when your, you know, quote unquote project got bloated, you just close bins, and you'd be able to kind of compartmentalize what's in the memory or what's not. I if I go over here to this sequence menu, I only have one sequence loaded right sure. now. Uh, over here, I have all these clips loaded. Mm -hmm. Right. Just choosing clear menu. All right. Now there's no things in the menu. Now it just freed up some RAM. That's a clear. That's like a clear uh, your RAM. Yeah. There's even a thing over here. Sorry, not right there. Uh, info. Right, clear bin memory. Nice. I mean, there's a there's a couple of very nice little high end features that are they're hiding is, out wait, wait, in the what was, what was that? This is showing me all the drive capacity on oh, nice. my system. Yeah. That's sweet. That's so nice. I can so you don't have to jump to the stuff. finder to figure that yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. So you know, again, the, the the point I was trying to make is that if I can get rid of the latency and I can make a decision when I hit K to pause, it pauses on that frame. If yeah. it doesn't, then I'm not a happy camper. Of course not. Right, right. You know? It's got to be. Frame so precise that way. And I had an experience uh, consulting on a show uh, where some Avid editors had to work with Final Cut Pro. And there was an editor who was so fast coming from Avid that he was like breaking Final Cut. I'd never seen anyone work that fast. And one of his big complaints was, I'm hitting K and it, it's three frames later that it stops. Oh. Big deal, three frames. Well, when you're, well, when yeah, you're an yeah. editor yeah. on a daytime yeah. talk show and you've got deadlines and you are used to pausing, I know. And it pauses. Whole, in a commercial <laughs> editing, whole fist fights would break out in, in edit bays over two frames. Yeah. Fist fights. <laughs> you know. The copy editor, it's, oh, it was ugly. Just I, that, I'd have a producer go that literally would be able to tell. He'd walk out of the room and I'd just mess with him. I'd take off two frames or one frame. He'd walk and watch and go, something, something, something that edit. Oh, did, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. 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 Just no. Sure. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if this is a crazy analogy, but you know, in Aliens, yeah. when the hero Ripley has to fight the the queen alien. Yes. Um, there's one sort of penultimate scene where she's trying to rescue the little girl, and she's really lean. She's got like her vest of grenades and her gun, but she's able to dart in and out of uh, you know the the hallways and, and, and stuff yeah. like that and get around. Okay. Right. In her final battle with the queen, she's encased in this big, huge loader kind of robot exoskeleton. Yep, yep. She can't move as fast. Now, some might say, "Look at the tools that she has. Look how outfitted she's bad. You know, she's very bad. You know what? Right? Well, she's loaded down. She's heavy. She can't quite move as fast. So there's something to be said, <laughs> right? Yeah. You got that a whole bunch a, of tools. That's a brilliant analogy. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. You know, yeah. Sorry. Well, we were talking about bloated, bloated, bloated apps. Yeah. The idea that there's just so much loading into the RAM. And there's so many features. You can't get something really basic done that you want to do. Because editing, when it comes down to it for me, is mark in, mark out, rinse, repeat. You know, I have to yeah. do that all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, I have to exactly. change my in and out. That's right. what editing is. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything else is great. You make it sound so glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> now I can see why everybody wants to be an editor. You so, should see when Pet yeah. Pietro Scalia goes to an after party in the what? Oscars. Pietro Scalia. Yeah, he's Ridley Scott's editor. Oh, okay. Thank you. But I would like to get points for consistency, staying with the Ridley Scott, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was Although good. Although bring it into Cameron. the next question because we have a great question here about <laughs> about audio editing. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So what about audio? This is from uh, Jeff. 
Uh, Final Cut Pro 10 has some nice audio mastering tools, even if it's missing a mixer. That's the question here. Right. How far can I get an Avid before I have to export to something else? In other words, what are the what are the built-in audio tools and versus yeah, when you right. when you'd want to go to, to do Pro, Pro Tools? tools. Let's say yeah. pretty far. Okay, so let's let's talk about Pro Tools because I think most people who know anything about post-production audio, that's pretty much the go-to tool. All right, so uh, in the tools menu, we have an audio mixer. All right, everyone's probably used to something like that. Yep. We also have a little audio EQ tool. Again, new to Avid um, Six, I can actually put these in. A same window using tabs. It's one mm -hmm. of my favorite new features. <laughs> uh, all right, and then I'll go over here to Audio Suite. These are old tools that we've often had. These are clip effects, which Avid calls segment effects. Final Cut Pro might call them filters. Okay. I can drag and drop something okay. onto some onto a, a clip, and it will apply. All right, but RTAS, which stands for Real Time Audio Suite Plugins. Real-time audio suite plugins. Now, this isn't a very you know sexy or glamorous looking tool, uh, but I'll just go ahead and say A1 um, mono EQ. Say I'll just get a little effect here. All right, nice interface. This is a Pro Tools effect. Right. So, in terms of how far can you go in Avid before going to Pro mm -hmm. Tools, you don't ever have to go to Pro Tools. So you've got the plugin, much like um, the the Logic plugins are yeah. built into Final Cut Pro 10. You've got the Pro Tools plugins accessible directly with Inside Avid. Exactly. So very similar kind of things. It's a perfect analogy. And, and again, yeah. these are task tools. They are distinguishable from the regular Audio Suite tools in that they apply to the entire track. So if I go to the track control panel, I'm not sure. Oh, if you I can't zoom make that in. apply to a single clip. No. Well, this particular an RTAS effect. Oh, mm -hmm. I, I need to make this larger. Hold on. Uh, nice. You're pretty facile with this interface, yeah. Mr. Steve. Um, I thought I just did that to R1. Well, anyway, oh, there it is. There's my EQ. <laughs> I put it on the wrong uh, insert. But you There's applied one, it on the two, whole three, track. four, five. Yeah. Right. Okay. Our task plugins by by design apply to the entire track, oh. and the audio suite plugins, and many of them are the same. I can find okay. a one band yeah. or three band EQ here, but this is a clip per clip effect. Okay. This is an entire uh, track. Now, if I do send this to Pro Tools, all of the automation keyframes, any kind of settings I've set in Avid are going to go over go in the AAF export. Now, of course, no one in Pro Tools cares at all what I've done as a picture editor. They will delete right. everything I've done. It out. Yeah. There's even a feature when I'm, <laughs> when I'm exporting for Pro Tools to strip out all uh -huh. of the RTAS effects. It's like, here, I've gotten this ready for you to make your job easier. And then they're like, yeah. I don't care about anything you've done because yeah. I know I can do it better. Yeah, exactly. And, when but, they can. But it, and they can. Yeah. And I like collaborating with other people who are experts in their field. Right. I used to say in my classes, you know, if you don't like collaboration, don't be an editor. Learn to paint. <laughs> you know. So good point. Uh, but again, hitting on the point I keep making, if you want to collaborate with someone in Pro Tools and they wanted to see what you've done so far and use that as a starting point, that option exists. The technology exists for that workflow to be followed. Mm. All right. Whether they do or not is a matter of choice, but at least you have those choices. You know, in the earlier days of Final Cut Soundtrack Pro, some information would make it over to Soundtrack Pro through XML, and some wouldn't. I think the keyframes didn't initially make it over, or yeah. maybe it was cross dissolves. I forget which. Yeah. And eventually, yeah, you could. So I just kind of like, give me the option, and then I'll say whether or not I'm going to use it. Good. Okay. Nice. Did, I think that answered the question pretty well. I think it was a great answer. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to have you back. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've got a bunch of other questions, a little all over the map here. One sure. uh, person, Roger, wrote in about uh, Boris Soundbite that he did a little research for us. Thank you, Roger, that uh, Boris Soundbite version 1.1 brings support to Final Cut Pro 10. Excellent. Just confirming mm -hmm. that it does work with Final Cut Pro 10, so check that out. Um, uh, from today's earlier music video shoot, so we, we did, and, and Steve got to watch some of this, and yeah. actually, not much more than that, give us good suggestions and shoot as well. <laughs> we did a music video shoot today with... Uh, uh, a band and a bunch of cameras and had a great time and somebody wrote like it seemed the floor was covered lightly with what looked like a layer of powder uh, yeah that was that was our uh... <laughs> no this is not even good there um, was, it, was, was it intentional to reduce reflections from the lights or did you guys forget to sweep the floor 
No, the floor, the floor, the, and, and by the way, the crew back here is, is like, they're complaining yeah. because they, they swept the floor assiduously. We, I saw did. them out there very, right. very, it was completely cleaned off. So what you're probably seeing is just some glare because we had a, a huge the floor, amount of, The floor was a little bit reflective. It yeah. was a little reflective. It's this black matte stuff. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. reflective. Um, but we had, uh, besides all the green screen lights up around here, banks of Kino flows, we have all these one-by-one uh, -by -one light panels mm -hmm. that we had about uh, a dozen of them. Uh, creating a lot of reflections. Um, and then there was all that cocaine I spilled. Yeah. <laughs> That'll do it. But that, that got rid of that in a hurry. Um, <laughs> subframe audio editing in the Avid. I think that subframe audio editing in Final Cut Pro 10 is great. Is that available in the Avid? That is a good question. I mean, certainly, as we pointed what? out earlier, I can zoom in to the subframe level. Here's between this oh, yeah, that blue right. and that other blue, that's a subframe. Right. So I could turn on, let's just see what I can do. I'll turn on volume for these two. Uh, I will, uh, let's see here. Is it this? I have not mapped the keyboard for this, but I'm trying to add a uh, keyframe, although I'm not seeing. Where's the rubber bands? I'm not seeing the overlay yet. Uh, I did volume. Let's see, is this? Uh, there you go. Oh, so there's your there's your waveform. Well, let me form. just let me just remind myself of uh, where the keyboard button is for keyframe. Yeah, that's the one I thought it was. It's right there. So I was hitting that key, but it was not adding the keyframe. Let me zoom out a tiny bit and try that again. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm sorry. I'm trying to do it on too many tracks. <laughs> exactly. That's probably it. There yeah, we there go. go. Okay. All right. So there's an audio keyframe. Now I'm going to move forward a frame. There's an audio keyframe. So the question is, even if I zoom in, can, you can add, I add an audio keyframe in there? It might restrict you to frame boundaries. I, yeah, I have to or, kind of give an advantage is, to uh, well, Final see, Cut see. Or, or or slipping. Can you slip? Can you slip an audio clip by you know less than one frame, or uh, edit it, edit it out, or blade it on on in between yeah, frames? Yeah, I'm gonna Next. I'm gonna go out on a limb. I think so. You know. If there's an avid editor out there, feel free to you know bust my chops if I'm wrong about this. I'm gonna say no, in terms of subframe, and you know that's the thing where when you go to Pro Tools, that's one of the advantages is you've got you know sample level type stuff you can do, mm -hmm. and that was one of the things in Final Cut Seven and Soundtrack Pro that I was really happy about the kind of subframe stuff that you could do. Yeah, I remember. Uh Demoing its countless NABs, Final Cut Pro 7. No, actually started in version one. Subframe mm -hmm. editing was there and showing the fact you can in, within the frame go within the frame down to mm -hmm. one. It was one ninety ninth of a sample in Final Cut Pro right. one through seven. Right. It's one eightieth of a sample in Final Cut 10. It just is. Of a second, so not, 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 not a sample. A second. A second. A second. But, but the point but is, do you miss those other twenty um, samples? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at this like little slice. It slices That's up awesome. that fr frame, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it really. It, I think it does make it. It makes a difference, especially if let's say you got maybe a little bit of mosquito noise from like a microphone, and you just, it's right on the frame boundary right. or right there. On the, you can get in there and just kind of notch it out. Um, which is which is which is handy. I mean, or you're, try, you're trying to join, take a breath out, or trying to join like somebody had two perfect phrases, and you're trying to actually join them together, and you've got some little yeah. piece that you need to deal with. Right. Now I just want to try one more thing before we totally give up here. I'm going <laughs> to the audio mixer and turning on the auto mode. A hey, Bart dude. All right. So now I'm going to go <laughs> ahead and uh, automate something. So if I hit this record button, uh -huh. I can actually record some audio keyframes. Oh, nice. All right. So the question is, when I go in and zoom in, are those subframe? And it doesn't look well, like so they're, they're not on the frame, frame boundary. Okay. No. Yeah. So uh, again, you know, you can say Avid does some things better, and Final Cut does some things better, and it just depends on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. I think so, we answered that. So along those lines, we have Vince asking. Um, he says, "Fess up." <laughs> All right. Fess, <laughs> no, fess, fess up. up. Oh no. What, what, what are the gotchas of Avid that make it a pain in the hind quarters? And the same question for Final Cut Pro 10 responders. What really ticks you off? Fair question. That is a fair yeah. question. Um, you know, the short answer is a lot less than, than used to be there. I mean, there were a lot of gotchas in the past. I think, um, I think the modal approach, you know, once, once I started cutting on Final Cut Pro uh, and went back to Avid, it felt kind of clunky to me at first. It was like, oh, I've got to go to a mode, and then I've got to do this. All right, so as a practical example, 
in earlier versions of Avid, if I'm you know scrubbing here in my sequence, and then I decided I wanted to move a clip, I had to choose a segment mode arrow, and yep. then I had to you know move something, and then if I wanted to move the playhead again, okay, I had to turn that off. <laughs> Yeah. You know, or if I wanted to do a, a splice in type, I had to choose that arrow instead of this arrow. Now, this is my own fault because I never mapped keyboard shortcuts for those two functions. All right, but now this is what I love about the current version of Avid. Let me zoom in here a little bit. So each of these tools is independently enabled. All right, but when you put them all together in this little smart tool palette where I can oh, that's toggle called them. smart pool to when it's got a bracket, it's now it's Yeah, this bracket around them that you can see highlighting. Yeah. All right. What that allows me to do is select all of them at once and then turn it off or on. Now with this, this is the red segment mode. All right. That'll make you move clips around but not affect sequence duration or have a ripple effect on anything. This is the splice in version of that. Here's something called the overwrite trim tool. Here's the ripple trim tool. All right. And intuitively, and this is what's so smart about the smart tool, if I'm in the middle of the clip, Notice if I'm in the upper half, it's the red arrow. The bottom half, it's the yellow one. If I get close to an edit point, yellow on the bottom, red hence, on the top. Hence smart. It knows where it is, and mm -hmm. then I'm going to, you should be using this tool if your yeah. mouse is here. And it's so intuitive, I even go down here to this keyframe. Now I'm adjusting oh, a keyframe. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Okay. So you have to switch tools at all. Have to switch I don't have to all. switch tools. Now, if I do have to do something like, oh, I want to scrub really quickly, this is what makes this tool amazing to me. All right? Shift tab, which is the shortcut that I never mapped, that's mapped by default in Avid, turns the whole tool off. So now I don't have to deal with anything. Now you're back into that modal. Yeah, thing. I could be modal if I want to. And the preferences exist. You know, Avid is is nothing if not listening to user mm. feedback now. So if I go to <laughs> here's a nice feature. I could go look for the timeline settings here in the settings right. window, but if I just type command plus while the timeline is the active window, it opens up the timeline settings. Right. If the composer is the active window, it opens up composer settings. So I just have to learn one keyboard shortcut for active window settings. All right. So this is what I find kind of funny is that, huh. look, if you want to only use one segment tool at a time, this checkbox is the disable smart tool checkbox. Mm -hmm. If you want to work in a traditional Avid mode, you just check that box. So that's like, I'm uncomfortable with new things, Should, let me do it the old way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, which is, which... I don't want to learn anything new, just give it to me the way I'm used to. Which, uh, fair, you know, when you've got a job to get done, mm -hmm. it's nice to be able to like turn it the way you want it. Like, let me learn on my own time, yeah. you know, like when this project is done. So I can get up to speed on this new thing, so the next one I'll be faster at. It's kind of like some of those cars that have this sort of hybrid automatic and manual transmission where you can shift and do an automatic transmission, but you move the gear shift over a tiny bit, and you can shift up or down yourself. Uh, I've never seen that. It's a, cool, it's a cool little feature. It's not really manual shifting, but no. if you're a manual shifter, then you could do that. Yeah. You know? And in a pinch, if you were in the snow and you needed it, and that was the one time you really needed to control and lock down that transmission, you could do that. Right. Well, now should we go to the final Well, I've got, yeah, yeah there's, okay. there's a couple, I want to get to those. There's a couple of interesting questions, but just in the context mm -hmm. of the Avid right now, and I think we'll, we'll jump into the, a couple of these other questions that are really interesting. Uh, keying in the Avid. So this is mm. uh, Mikey who says, the new keyer in Final Cut Pro 10 is really amazing, which I totally agree. I agree yeah. uh, how does the keyer in Avid work? All right. Uh, well, you, you, do, you have some green screen I do footage. have some green screen stuff. So here is, and I think I rendered this, so let's just watch this just for a second. Supercharged energy micro. Oh, I probably should monitor the higher track so that uh, we can actually see these effects. <laughs> okay. The world's first supercharged energy micro shot. Now the guy flipping around, okay? I can't believe you pulled this that key. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm pretty, yeah. I know that footage and the, the green screen was a, was horrible. I mean, I mean, you can see Guinness. Like, yeah. Anyway. So uh, this is... Very familiar, yeah. too. This is... And, and actually, Mark, this is something I think you'll be able to speak to. Uh, being a, a motion expert. The key that I'm using here, oh, this is my animat. Sorry, let me step in a little bit and go to the other key. All right, so this is what's known as the spectra mat effect. And it allows you to pull a key by sort of uh, 
you know, choosing a spectrum and and Interesting. being able to, you know, what's I, I should green, probably what's that green blob there? So that that's the actual what's being keyed. So it, it's oh, sort of like yeah, that's the range right there. color space, and oh. he's he's carving out a chunk of that color space. That's actually yeah. really helpful key. feedback. Yeah, yeah. So let me try to get rid of that. It's like and start in the, from the, scratch, the color maybe. application. You can see that in three D space. That little three D kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. All right, so here's my green screen. So I'll see how well. What a horrible. <laughs> yeah, I'll see how well I can do yeah. this from scratch here. So I'll go to the effects tab. All right, I'm going to look for key, and I'm going to do spectrum mat. All right, and I have to admit, like Avid's, you know, uh, sorry, Avid's uh, motions uh, key tool. What, what, what's it called? Well, it's just a, this is there's a chroma key. It used key to be called Prime Mat. There's right? a key. Prime Mat. Yeah, yeah, Prime Mat before, but now just the key because the key in Final Cut Pro 10 is mm -hmm. directly from Motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that new key. So I mean, again, I can sort of do like an eye drop thing where I'm like, hey, I want to. Sorry, let's see. <laughs> want to key out that color. All right, and that was pretty quick. But here's where the the heavy lifting comes in. Let me undo this. So you've got this color spectrum and you're trying to figure out what to key out, this is kind of intuitive. This black area is what is being keyed. You have to choose the color where this should be keyed. And I've never been one for using these kinds of controls because I didn't think I understood how to do it that way. I like to be able to point and click with an eyedropper or something. Right. Uh, but now I can go ahead and go into key color. And let's say I start you know, tweaking this a little bit. Look what's happening to that black area as I move these controls around. All right, it's actually moving that around so I can go say, look, I want green. I want more green, you know, less red. All right, so I, I tend to do things with keys where I start with a broad stroke, a really quick eyedropper click, mm -hmm. but then I have to tweak it a little bit. Um, there's some real beauty to this, and you can see how that's like a feathered edge, if yeah. you will, between the gradient and the, the black area. So again, when we start playing with controls like tolerance, all right, and uh, softness, you really get an amazing amount of feedback here that helps you set up the key here. So I think this is a, a great tool. Uh, probably I'm a little faster and easier. I like the real-time ability sure. in motion or probably Final Cut 10. I haven't tried it in Final Cut 10, but where you can play a loop and just look at that map and kind right. of play and with key, it. Play with it at, in real time. That's, that, that that's, is, that's yeah. really the money because yeah. I got the key working at this frame, but now I got to start looking at other frames and seeing if I need to you know, keyframe. Uh, are you able with Media Composer to do real-time playback of multiple HD streams while you're while you're editing? And what, does it have that kind of same thing that you can do in Final Cut 10? Yeah, yeah. In fact, this little okay. green dot is an indication in the effect icon that yeah. this is a real-time effect. Uh -huh. um, and uh, right now, um, if I go into the effect palette, I, I probably can't find an effect in here that doesn't have a wow. green dot. It's is that like, all the effects played to that one? Click. This is all the, I mean, I'm just going through this whole yeah. palette of effects. I think the only one in here I can think of is in time warp, reverse motion, which mm -hmm. I wouldn't think that would be the hardest thing in the world to do in mm -hmm. real time, but apparently that's the one thing in the, in the <laughs> basic palette. Everything else is kind of real time. Now you start stacking layers, you're going to eventually you know, run into some performance issues. But sure. um, what, it, I, what it lacks, I think, is... Using this example of the key, where in motion, which is what I'm familiar with, I could set a loop and then just play with that sort of matte density and right. be able to see, you know, there's my white areas, there's my black, mm -hmm. there's little pixels creeping into the white area, and I can just keep playing with that in real time. I don't think Avid quite plays as smoothly mm -hmm. in real time doing a loop. But there is a play loop feature in the effect editor. When you're doing audio effects, there's a play loop feature. Right. I mean, it definitely has that capability. Uh, I just have to say, you know, in, in some cases, motion happens to be, you know, better at that particular type yeah. of, uh, you know, operation. Yeah. Here's a, Paul says, uh, the, the Final Cut Pro 10 skimmer, love it or hate it? People are very passionate about the skimmer. Skimmer. What's your reaction? And I'll just, I'll just throw in that I, I feel like the skimmer is Switch exactly like Final skimmer. Uh, yeah. the, the skimmer in Final Cut Pro 10. What he's referring to is by default, if you move the mouse around, right, that, the playhead's going to move with it no matter what. There you well, go. It's just escape. Yeah, this is. Yeah. So let's just show people what what he means by that. Well, skimming is is uh, again. You have this little line. You can you can move through. I personally like you. I love it. I love the fact that. I don't using Final Cut Pro 10. I, I don't even I hardly ever use JK and L. Well, well, but here's here's what I was yeah. going to say about that. I, I love it and I hate it. I, I feel like the skimmer is exactly like snapping. 
Yeah. When you really <laughs> want snapping, it's great. When you don't, you, you know, it gets completely the same way, but you just tap the end key to turn it on and off. And the skimmer is the same way. Well, you, you just can't, you can't you tap the keyboard. Off, I know. You can just tap the keyboard shortcut yeah. S to turn it on yes, and off. If it bothers you, right. just, you know, press So there's S. certain times S. that it's super useful where you want to immediately get to something, but if you don't like it, just tap S and turn mm -hmm. it off. And of course, it, it works in the timeline. It works on anything up in your event browser right. as well. Um, so I... I think to me it's a, it's an additional it's a plus it's an additional thing that you can turn mm -hmm. off if you don't like it at yeah, all. Yeah, but, but, the but other do you thing, use it? I, like in fact, here's why I like it. Um, it's it's editorial. We st we spoke earlier about working so fast that you know the mm -hmm. interface interface gets out of the way, right? Yeah. Now you have these edit modes right here. You have a connect edit, you have an insert edit, and you have an append edit, right? Now before in in, in you know Avid slash or at least Final Cut Seven, you know, it's always about where the playhead is. You know, you got to move the playhead. And let, let me go ahead and uh, go ahead and uh, get a uh, clip uh, loaded up in here. Let me just um, open up this, open up the Quintessa event, and select some clips here. Okay, let me just find some uh, other clips here. There we go. Also, so the nice thing is, is that I'm, 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 I'm flying along here. You know, say I'm, I'm moving. The, I, I'm marking. The, I'm, I want to mark that. So I'm going to press an in. So I got an in. I got an out. Right up there. And you're just tapping I, I, I know. Right now, before I just oh, I'm skimming along. And oh, I'm right. Oh, right there. That's where I want the editor to go. I just as soon as I move the playhead, I press. In this case, I'm going to do um, wedge. Uh, we could do a wedge edit. A <laughs> uh, wedge would be insert edit. W for wedge. Oh, all right. That's all right. That's no, not Apple Store. Not, not like, right? it's a trap! <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Q is connect, right? So so I, I, just, got, I just want to do like a, an, an insert edit. I just move the playhead here. W. Done. And I keep moving. Yeah. Move, the, move the skimmer over here. W. It's very fast. So I find in terms of yeah. being able to um, assemble something really, really fast, I just move the skimmer. W. Just move the skimmer. Q. Move the skimmer. Mm -hmm. W, move the skimmer, right. you know, and then right. D for override, yeah. which is, by the way, there's no override here button here. You have to, but if you know the keyboard shortcuts, uh, there they are. And the beauty of these commands here is that they all work with the skimmer, wherever the skimmer yes. is. And mm -hmm. that's, in terms of speed, I, I love that about Final Cut Pro 10. So, awesome. Yeah. I have to kind of agree. I mean, it's, yeah. it's uh, there's even a, a, a program we use to create our training right. uh, called ScreenFlow. Yes. It has a couple of, uh, sort of editorial pluses over even the most sophisticated. <laughs> I agree. You know? does, I does. agree. I really <laughs> yeah. agree. Folks could learn. The, the, like, like, exactly. The three A's could learn from oh, God, the listen, Okay, well, yeah. yeah, let's talk about that for a minute because going back to the question earlier, what do you not like? What do you wish was there? Yeah. In front of, I wish you could set, I'm going to go ahead and set in and out point here, right? Mm -hmm. And move the skimmer. There's a, an in and out. Actually, do it in. Move the playhead over here and then out. Oh, oh, man, I'm sorry. I should, take a final, I should take a Final Cut Pro uh, class, don't you think? Oh. Okay, so so look, I would love. What if I have a bunch of stuff stacked up? I would love yeah. to be able to just press a key and have everything on. And I'm, I can't call these tracks. Yeah. Uh, but everything above and below the primary mm -hmm. store line would get sucked out of there instead of just. The content on the primary, well, yeah. it's, uh, instead the of primary story, right? Line. See, it's not. And now it's, it's just removing all well, of those right, connected because clips, that connected not just clip is, them. Exactly. Yeah. I want to say, like the old Final Cut Seven, I could set an in and out point, and depending on your tracks, were I think it was auto selected, mm -hmm. right. we would just pull out yeah. that whole piece, and I find that really useful. I have people email me say, I, I have this the stacked, um, I call them stacked now, you stacked a uh, bunch of clips, and I just want to pull out a piece of everyone. I, I would like to see yeah. that feature. Uh, another feature I would like to see. I'm not crazy about these half waveforms. Uh, I like to see, I like to see. I like to be able to open up a full waveform mm -hmm, editor mm -hmm. uh, and do stuff. I mean, you can. Uh, we're working on an audio tutorial right now, and one of the things that came up was, okay, well, how can I work on this? I could certainly go into here and I could, you know, make the clip height really big, and I can do this. And I guess, you know, that's nice. I just, I'm so. I like seeing the zero crossing. I like to be yeah. able to see the zero crossing. So in other words... Uh, what, what information is in that that you can't get out of here? here here's what it is. It, it has to do with audio editing. They, they have the subclip feature, but it doesn't go far enough for me. Because a lot of times you're editing on something, and you don't have complete silence before the word. Mm -hmm. There's something there. It's like... Yeah. There's just something there, and you can't really you can see it in this view. But if you had, if you had a full waveform, and you look and you're looking at the zero cross, you can say, oh, there's 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 a little bit of noises. There's a little bit mm -hmm. of audio mm -hmm. that what's supposed to be silent isn't. I, 
it's just a matter. It's a matter of visuals and visibility. Yeah. I just I want to be able to see the zero point crossing line so that right. I can know that there's some content there. I need to bring it out to minus ninety six. And, and you're probably used to it because every audio editing app or NLE you've ever seen has had the had the full yeah. thing in there, pretty much, right? I mean, yeah. I it's just. I'm not crazy about the the halfway form. Yeah. Uh, now, in fact, if you if you decrease the clip height again, I think it helps illustrate your point because there was a smaller height where it looked like there's no waveform there. It right. looks like it's completely silent. Right. Because I'm looking at the bottom. Yeah. But you know. But it's, see, it's it, not, you uh, can't. You gotta look. You, you have, have to be able to see complete quicker. silence sometimes. You want to. I, mean, yeah. I mean, I could zoom in here. I mean, to uh, to Final Cut's credit, I, I do like very much the fact you can, uh, you know, zoom wanna, all wanna, the way in there and you know, but. See, it's like, look, it's just... And there's your subframe. There's it's, your yeah. subframe. There, there's, see that little grid? There's your subframe, mm -hmm. you know, and then you could keep zooming in, you know, and and uh, by the way, you there actually is a view mode here. Uh, where is it? Um, oh, see, I'm in zoom to sample mode. So I can actually zoom to the mm -hmm. sample level. I can turn that on or off, but that that's, that's why we're yeah. able to go in with such fine detail. And I think that is a plus. But just give me the ability to see both sides mm -hmm. of the waveform. I, you know, if yeah. I was going to use it as a as a more of an audio tool, I mean, I'm, I'm just smiling because I want to quote you on that um, where you said you really need to be able to see silence sometimes. Did I say that? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't you need to be able to see silence? It makes it's very deep. deep. It's yes, very deep. you got to be able to see silence. I think if you if you meditate long enough, <laughs> yeah, you or can see take silence. shrooms, I think you yeah. can. Either that's a shortcut way. Colors, that's a shortcut way taste, never get you. Yeah. <laughs> so, two um, plus two equals chicken. Uh, just a couple other questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a Brian Regan. We do have, we have a couple other questions here. Right. Um, yeah. A little, a little bit off topic, but we should, we should bring these up just to handle over here. So there's a question about: uh, Can you demonstrate how to create a custom Final Cut Pro 10 titling transition template? Yikes! So, um, <laughs> so I would say in ten seconds, go. So, so uh, no, we can't demonstrate right here, but it's it's very doable. Whether it's a, I would say a title or a transition, because those are two different things. There's a title, there's a transition, there's effects, there's generators, um, and you can create those in motion. And and actually, the rest of the question says we're creating weekly video uploads. The opening titles change. Is it easy to create a group of transitions in the themes list that can be dropped in at the beginning? And I think they mean titles not transitions, at the beginning of a project and adjust as needed. Oh boy, is it ever, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what motion is made for. And in fact, in Final Cut, in all those browsers, here if we can cut to the, the screen here, um, the Final Cut interface, uh, right here is our titles browser with all these titles. And all of these titles in here are all, hey, a, yeah. uh, let me just go to all. These are actually all motion projects. Right. So you can make your own in motion, save them, and they'll show up in here. And then you can go in and drop them in your, your weekly. It's, it's made. It is perfect for a weekly show where you just need to change the content of a title. So you build mm -hmm. your own animated title. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would do a plug for that because I do a training at rippletraining.com that will teach you exactly how to do that. And right. you can there watch, may, there's you can watch the There's Ripple Training video and text. Yeah. May I do a plug for that? Because oh, please. That would, it, it has more credibility coming from you than me. Saying, I, I don't know motion as well as Mark, it, it should be said. So I kind of over the last few years have been lazy, so I just learn everything from watching your tutorials. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think you have... I want to say the the rigging and and that's like rigging its own, and publishing. Yeah, that's, that's its own it. tutorial. Publishing. Right. So this was a thing I, I sort of drew out of a hat when I had to go to a Final Cut Pro user group meeting, and if you will defend Final Cut Ten from the wolves, and I had to say you know if you haven't seen what motion does with Final Cut Ten, then you're not really talking about Final Cut Ten because the the ability to go beyond what used to be a nice nifty feature of a motion master template, yeah. the idea that you can number one publish only the features you want the Final Cut editor to control, right. that's beautiful. It is. The fact that, that, especially in an environment, I imagine the sharing environment, a networked environment where this really could be a pro tool, the, the ability for an editor to call up and just say, hey, you know what, Mark? I now need to control a gradient for the text, and I don't have that control. And Mark can say, okay, hold on for a second, and in about a minute and a half, go into the motion project and publish that to the to the template. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm good. All right, that is huge. And so you might have something you need to repeat week after week after week. Okay, that's great. And what's really, but you might need to tweak it a little bit well, sometimes. And the ability yeah. to get in there and do that is. 
you know. Well, what's really nice about that is if you're working in a, an environment, a corporate environment, or some sort of a media environment where uh, you're a graphic designer and you don't want to give the editor too much control. Yes. You're like, I want to only give him the ability to change the color of the font, but not the font or the position. They can move it around, but they can't change the color. They can't change uh, you know, the palette. Logo colors or something, yeah. Right, and so in a lot of ways, you're still giving the editor control over like placement re relative to kind of the frame they're working in. Um, I think absolutely it is the, the you know the combination of motion Final Cut mm -hmm. is is unique. And again, yeah. there's uh, the, the plug I was trying to make was just the, the yeah. ease that I felt yeah. I, I learned that yeah. the way you kind of showed how to do it and yeah. sort of step by step get into it. But it, it can't, you can't underestimate how important it is for the editor not to see all that stuff too, yeah. because I can sit down behind the wheel of my rental car and drive to Petaluma even though I've never done it before. But sometimes getting a new effect in the effect editor in Avid or doing something the equivalent, it's like I've sat down behind like a, you know a jumbo jet right. control, and there's still a steering wheel, things. and in theory I can blot all that stuff out <laughs> just with the steering wheel. But I'm like, no, I need are, to. Are some of these important that I should know about? Yeah. I need like to just, go crawl show me the corner ones and shiver for yeah. a couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so you're getting some good analogies yeah. tonight. Yeah. That's a like, yeah. good. So it clears away the clutter and lets you just focus on what you need. So um, a couple more questions in here, and if you do have a question, get it in now, because we'll probably wrap up in the next few minutes here. Yeah. So we're just going to go for a couple more here. Just had a question come in about round tripping. Uh, in Final Cut Pro 7, we had the ability to go to motion with round tripping. With, pr with Premiere Pro, you can go to After Effects. Right. What does Avid has that will do that type of work? Will Final Cut Pro 10 ever get that type of workflow? Motion tracking is what I use this workflow for most often. So to answer the last question first, Anytime you have a question that will Final Cut Pro ever get whatever. <laughs> don't ask it on the, the yeah, show. <laughs> they, they, well, the answer is I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. know. Wait, yeah. don't know. And, and if anybody did know, they couldn't say. That's right. Yeah. And if anybody, if anybody knew, they couldn't say that they knew and couldn't say. <laughs> Right, so nobody nobody can ever know what's going to come up, except the, for the first time that I've ever seen. You know, Apple announced that the next version of Final Cut Pro 10 will have uh, a specific list of features yeah. like multicam. Mm -hmm. Multicam. Right. So, um, if Apple says it, that's that's the only thing we have to yeah. go by. But the other question about um, Avid is there any round sort of tripping. round tripping to other apps? Yeah, I don't at think all? I have to show this because I I did already. <laughs> the only equivalent I can think of is using the title tool in Marquee. It very much is a round trip kind of process because you go to the other app, you create your title, it's then in your in your Avid timeline. When you have to edit it, you can go back to it, make a change, and that instantly updates into your Avid. Um, what is different about it that I think is kind of a nice feature of the Final Cut universe is when you finish editing that title in the title tool or marquee, it does actually create media. It doesn't take a long time, but it is creating it's media rendering. every single time. Yeah. Whereas you're kind of in a, in a data-only world mm -hmm. in Final Cut 10 yeah. where there is no media created until you render. And I, like, I like that yeah. yes, feature. That's yeah. a good point. Really good point. Uh, and that was Mikey. Thank you, Mikey, for that. Uh, error capture. When things go caca in Avid, where does it dump its errors or what went wrong? And is it useful to snoop that out? Mm -hmm. um, can you snoop the caca? It sounds yes. like what the question is being asked you know here. And, Just and curious if there's an easily accessible error log. And that's uh, Vince asked that question. Yeah, and if there's, uh, if you've ever done anything with the OS, this is kind of an amazing thing to have built into an app. There is actually something called console in the Avid. It is identical in many respects to, the OS, to console, console in the OS. Not only is it identical in that it's logging a whole bunch of stuff. Well, actually, that's more like something else with the error logs. So there's all sorts of information in here. Uh, I wish I could remember this. Let me see if I can remember this. List AMA underscore plugin. So this is like a, a command. Unknown okay. Command. I don't remember. I don't remember the <laughs> command. I could look this up, but the idea is that it's it's logging errors to an unbelievable, detailed degree, and then you can type in certain commands. Um, if we give out, uh, I'd be happy to share this with someone. Um, if you go to my website or my, sorry, my email, which is Steve at editdog .net, um, I'll send you the link to something where someone published out, you know, on a on a listserv. Uh, all the console commands in Avid that you can get it to do things. Wow. And that includes oh. things like having it dump some memory and having it do some things and having it change some of the functionality. So It's like Avid's version of the terminal. Yeah, that's probably what I meant to say is, is console that's what it looks like terminal. To me. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I think you're right. The, the, con the console app will give you all that all that mm -hmm. information, error information. And I've had, uh, you know, my 
techie friend that I call when something is arise and bring up console. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he'll tell me what it says, but I, I can't, you know, and he'll say launch terminal. Like, oh God, okay. <laughs> like I'm afraid to quit the terminal because it's, yeah. every, but, but he walks me through it. So, um, yeah, it's not a good, it's not a good name for something because you're talking, people are scared already about mucking around with a, oh, am I going to kill my computer? Yeah, just open the command called terminal. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, <laughs> I mean, there's no grave robber command. <laughs> Awesome. Um, uh, is, is, is Lion really working with Final Cut Pro 10? Working with Final Cut Pro 10. Remember the problems we were having in your class in August. So what this is a reference to is Steve and I taught a class back in last August, actually right here in right. the studio, sure. when uh, Final Cut was on 10.0.0. Oh, oh, yeah, it was, there wasn't yeah, even an it was update yet. Brand new. And we had uh, there were a couple of, of issues throughout the day. I think there was two yeah. that. that, mm -hmm. that that happened in Lion and didn't happen in Snow Leopard. Um, those are gone now. They're, yeah, they fixed they, they, those. They fixed those. Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, Final Cut Pro 10 is ready for Lion. Yeah. I've been using it on Lion consistently. It's all I use. You know, I, I made the switch about a month and a half ago or something, and I, I think it's rock solid on Lion. I think you, the right thing to do is to move to Lion. Mm -hmm. I'm still the, one thing I'm still seeing. I don't think it's a Lion issue, but there was an issue with the titles becoming reset in 10.0.1 yeah. where you would open your project and the titles you had typed in were gone. They were yeah. just replaced with title. Mm -hmm. And that fixed for the most part, I usually, but I did have it once happen with 10.0.2 and it's like, oh no, now it's unpredictable. You know, we don't know. Right. But for the most part, that's fine. But I don't think it's a lion issue. So I, I would go, and you're lying too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, good. I think that's truthful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> iBooks, textbooks from Ripple. Stephen, Mark, what do you think of the new iBooks authoring app? Plans so, to create any textbooks for iPad? It's so funny that, that you mentioned that. Today? That was one of the things. Like when I read that, I read that on. Yeah, my we just, so this is. We should back up a minute. Yeah. They, they just say what. So today, Apple made an announcement about. There were three things, right? They announced um, an updated um, uh, ebook. Um, application publisher, yeah. publisher but they, they have a new authoring tool a new authoring tool for authoring ebooks yep. right that's the big thing is it and called they, iwrite no no okay no, it's, it's called uh, iBooks 2 or iBooks I forget, I forget what it's called. Yeah. I, I, we just saw, we've been shooting all day, but we just saw that thing and we looked it up and it was like, we both were like, oh my God. Yeah, so, to, right? it, really, it, it, it's, to, again, it's this idea of decentralizing mm -hmm. that, we, that the average person wants to write the American novel can actually do it now. And you can, you can now publish the stuff yourself. And yeah. that's really exciting for content creators like, like Mark, myself, and, and you, Steve, because we're, we're going to make a book. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, I actually have been working on a book, but um, I can't really talk about it yet. And that now that this tool is, is uh, I don't have to, I have to play with it, but I'm very excited. In fact, do text, do video. I mean, because the, the thing is, is that I, it's great reading content on the iPad. Yeah, and this thing, it's they're positioning it for textbooks so that uh, authors can make textbooks for the iPad. Mm -hmm. So those days of lugging around campus with your 500 yeah. pounds of books and breaking your back. It was actually a smart decision. Got an iPad. I, personally, I was saying it's a smart decision on Apple's uh, point of view because, I, you know, Amazon's kicking their butt. And in mm -hmm. terms of the, their bookstore versus Amazon's, Amazon is totally... I, I think this, this is a smart play because they're saying, okay, we're going to make iBooks really is because now because I haven't looked at it but look if you have all these authors now publishing to the bookstore and now you now you're kind of vested in in, in, in Apple's model of content delivery um, so I, I think it was a smart uh, smart decision on their so, part. So we know very little about it but it looks really interesting yeah. and we can't wait to, to dig yeah. into it. I would like to add that historically it has a satisfying yeah. feel to it because it's really Apple that kind of invented or, or brought about desktop publishing in the first yeah. place. I mean, that was one of That's the good point. Yeah. first things they ever did. And it's almost like it's yeah. coming home to, yeah. to where it started and saying, all right, we've revolutionized some other fields. Let's get back to where we started and see what we can do with this. It's about distribution now. Yeah. yeah. So Carolyn, are there any more questions? I'm not seeing anything else uh, new on here. Have we? Would, Yeah, there's just a comment about uh, avid response. Not really a question, more of a comment there. So I think we're good on that. Um, okay. He's I will. <laughs> and talk about. Uh, okay, I sure will. So first of all, I want to thank you, Steve, for coming on the show. It's well, been great to have me. you here, and you, know, you came up a long way. It was a long day. Um, but it's been great. I mean, this has been a really, really great educational and very eye-opening for for both of us who are not uh, avid mm -hmm. users at all. It's very interesting to see what's possible. Yeah. And I do want to give a shout out to the Pixel Core crew. 
I mean, yeah. they've done an amazing job. I mean, we, we, we were here at 8 o'clock. We set up. We did a music video shoot. We, they, they completely struck the set, put this set up, and we were ready to mm -hmm. go at 6.30. I mean, I, it's pretty impressive. It so, is. And you can't even tell yeah. we're actually outdoors right now. So this <laughs> whole thing is just a facade. It's yeah. really amazing. So yeah. um, if people want to contact you, are you comfortable? I think you said yeah. your email. Just why don't you say that again, what you're... That's yeah, uh, both my email address and my uh, website are uh, have editdog.net. So there actually is an edit dog, isn't there? There, well, there actually was. Thank you for uh, bringing up that painful subject. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you go on to uh, www.editdog.net, uh, you'll see my my dog uh, editing on Final Cut. Um, or I used to, St Steve at yeah, editdog.net. Exactly. Oh, Steve yeah. at editdog.net. Okay, great. I used to. I, I thought there should be a cool tagline, which which was, uh, "I could teach a dog to edit. Why not you?" <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know That's now. Great. But yeah, if you go there again, uh, if you're if you're interested in finding out um, that list of console commands for Avid, uh, you know when we come out with our with our uh, training for for Avid, obviously there will be sure. questions and stuff generated from that. Right. So so just to mention again that that you are com you have a um, a very comprehensive Avid training coming out on from Ripple Training. Mm -hmm. uh, Imminently, imminently, yes. yes. Imminently. Hopefully within the month. <laughs> okay, Hopefully, with, yes. with, within the month, coming yeah, out. Yeah. And then uh, if people want to learn anything more about Final Cut Pro, MotionRippleTraining.com right. is yeah. place to go. And then we're going to be continuing to produce MacBreak Studio uh, podcast. Yeah, so we do a, besides this monthly show, this monthly live show that we generally do the, the third Thursday of the month is kind of how it's been working out since last June. Uh, we do this live show, very kind of informal thing. We also do a weekly uh, podcast called Mac, Mac Break. <laughs> losing Mac my voice now. Break Studio. Mac Break Studio Mac that you can find on, on iTunes uh, and also on YouTube. And mm -hmm. uh, short little five minute to 10 minute tutorials, tips, and Sometimes tricks, post production yeah. things. Sometimes we go on a bit. <laughs> yeah, so check that out, rippletraining.com. Um, uh, Twitter at Ripple Training. Mm -hmm. If you want to follow Ripple Training, that's where we post information about new products and we do a lot of free. Uh, plugins. Effects, plugins that we, we do for Final Cut Pro 10. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for tuning in and watching the show today. Thank you very much for giving us some questions because it's what makes the show yeah. interesting and have content. We're great questions really tonight, good. and it, it really made it uh, great for us. And yeah. hopefully it was useful for you to do that. And hopefully we'll see you back here in a month. Uh, anything else for anybody? We're going to do the dating game kiss. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, I guess we're going to just cut to the after show, but this will be the end of our show, right. so thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for watching. Good night. Bye, people.